is Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. It's so nice to see you all here today, or at least to know you're all here. Thank you so much for supporting us in this work. Uh, I, I was really heartbroken not to be able to give the in-person flower workshop in coming up here in Berkeley this year. And it's my attempt to make a substitute for that workshop virtually. And I'm so pleased that you all are supporting and trying out some of these techniques. So without too much further ado, uh, let me first say that my agenda today is to teach via example how to process a high key light box, light pad image, such as the ones that we photographed on uh, two weeks ago. So I'm going to share my screen. Here you go. Now I'm going to have to zoom rather quickly through the presentation. The uh, software here doesn't give me the option of starting it up where I want, so you'll have to bear with looking at a few images on the light box till we get there. And here's where I wanted to start. So remember that the workflow overview is to start with a high key bracketed sequence of photos. That's what we did uh, two weeks ago. To, to use post-production using a combination of layers. That's what we're gonna do today. And creative effects and so on, that's what we're gonna do next time. So then, so then let's go to, um, let's review quickly the exposure. And here we go. I want to note that you can go and review last week's recording up on YouTube. We were able to get to processing it and uploading it on YouTube. And okay, here we go. Too many images, too many flowers. What wonderful time we have. Okay. So, as I said, you can review la uh, the last uh, session up on YouTube, but the gist was to take seven to 10 exposures, go from completely overexposed to manual bracket exposures by one EV increments using shutter speed. And this was a uh, Dahlia showing a four second to a 30th of a second spread. And the processing version of that dahlia is shown here with the hdr on top of the layer stack the brightest image at the bottom of the layer stack and this slide is the gist of what we're going to do today of course the devil is always in the details so you start with the most overexposed image that way you can see what you're doing. There's also another hidden benefit to doing this, a kind of wonderful trick that works to the creator's advantage, which I'll explain to you as we go along. Then you use the same uh, settings and whether it's an Adobe Camera Raw, that's what ACR stands for there, or Lightroom, actually doesn't too much matter. I will show both in the course of this presentation. Both Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom use the same engine underneath to process raw images, although the controls are a bit different in each. Then successive images are added with layering, layering masks, and the brush tool. Consider adding the reserved HDR blend at the top of the stack to add punch. You can see that in this layer stack of the Stalia with an HDR image uh, added on top. Okay. Let's go and look at this in practice. So I'm going to open up what we photographed in class two weeks ago. 
You'll recall I did two quick arrangements while we had this incredible multi-camera setup going on. I want to uh, start, I'm, I want to show how to work with this image, which uh, looks pretty dark on my screen. Let me, let me put this up full size so we can see it better. This is a 30th of a second here. Okay, too dark. 15th of a second, eighth of a second, quarter of a second, half a second, one second, two seconds, four seconds, and that's probably about it. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is select the entire set of images, and I'm going to note again, this is eight images. They're approximately or exactly one EV apart, bracketed by shutter speed. They go from what the camera said was the right exposure, the 1 30th of a second, which in the case of a backlit light box image looks way too dark to almost totally white here at four seconds. Now, I am going to send these through Nick HDR FX Pro and get an automated version of HDR with this. Uh, with this. The version that's going to come out of the HDR program is most definitely not going to be perfect. In fact, it'll be um, a little unfortunate, but it will first of all show us some things, and second of all, it will have pieces we can use as we process the image. I also have to say that um, you can use Photoshop's HDR, you can use Lightroom's HDR, you can use Aurora's HDR program. I'm not saying there aren't differences between these different programs. You know, some people love one, some people love another. It kind of depends as much as anything what you have as, uh, as you use. It isn't all that important to this process, it just adds a little bit more. Um, what what but I, I i don't tend to get very religious about these things i mean there are there are people who say well i have to have this camera brand or that camera brand or this software or that software well with all these things it's almost more important that you know how to use it than what it is and you know, it, what comes with Lightroom and what comes with Photoshop is fine. I'm kind of in the habit of using Nick HDR because I've been using it for a while and it works pretty well and it's built into the software that I have, but, uh, but it really doesn't matter much which one one uses. What you may be glad to know also is that for the other examples I've prepared for this class, I've created knockdown versions so we won't have to watch the, the uh, progress bar on the screen for quite so long. They, uh, one reason that I like to listen to music while I do this is it makes the waiting go by. So at this point, you'll just have to listen to my mellifluous voice as the progress bar keeps going and going. All these, um, HDR combination programs do take a while because they are combining things on a pixel basis and as we all know modern cameras have a pretty uh, ha have a pretty high resolution so that means lots of pixels and here here you have these eight different high resolution images all of which are getting combined so that does take a while but it the results will be worth it when we get there Phyllis, while I'm, while I'm watching this do its thing, are there any uh, questions that it might be reasonable to answer quickly? Uh, Barbara says it's, at, it's very refreshing to see the whole process. Good. That's <laughs> and, part of the point. I mean, when we do this in a workshop, not only do we see the whole, in a human live workshop, not only do we see the whole process, and I'm going to do this process at least twice more, as I said, with knockdown version, so this part of it won't take so long. But um, I wanted to do this on the untouched raw files that were that were shot two weeks ago so that people could see that this is actually the real thing. I'm not faking anything here. I'm doing this in real time. I've never processed this image before. So the other part of, of 
seeing the whole process from beginning to end is you have to do it too. You don't learn it just because you watch me doing it. You learn it by first watching me doing it and then doing it yourself. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Phyllis. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Kurt has the question, which is related. Would it be possible to post the eight images so we could play with them too? Um, I think I'm perfectly willing to do that. We'll have to figure out how, you know, what the best way to do that is, but we'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, Seta has the question, why don't you crop the image to get rid of the rug? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, but I, I believe you, this is going to be answered for you as, as the development goes on. The short version of this, as I said before, there's a fringe benefit of starting from the lightest image and going to the darkest one. Um, that that mean the fringe benefit is that you don't have to crop. You can get rid of, of anything you don't want, and it might not just be a rug in the context. It might also be a tripod leg or something else by just painting it with white on the whitest part of the background. Mm -hmm. Turns out that that's more effective than cropping. If you if you crop here, you would have to. It, it, it becomes messy because you don't want to crop something where you're going to be combining other versions of the same image because you can get things out of alignment very easily. So um, the okay. next thing I do, I can use the slider, but you'll, the, the answer to that question is coming up here in the process. Great question. I can use the slider bar to pick lighter or darker portions. What's the blend it's going to use? That's what the slider bar shows me. Generally, you don't want to play with it too much. It's fairly good to leave it at the default. Since I had the camera on a tripod, I don't check alignment and I don't check ghost reduction. There's no need to do those things in this circumstance with how these were photographed. Keep in mind that, um, the keep, keep a sort of asterisk in mind about alignment because you'll see something related to alignment questions coming up. Oh, Harold, uh, Jeff has the question, is your workflow into HDRFX Pro coming from Bridge or Photoshop? This is coming from Bridge. However, keep in mind that, uh, that's a great question, by the way, this is coming from Bridge. However, keep in mind that HDRFX Pro is itself a plugin that runs with either Lightroom or Photoshop. So. By opening HDRFX Pro, I'm in effect opening Photoshop too. And Ron May asks, do you ever use flash, even at a low level, to light the darker flowers? Um, well, you know, we, we, we addressed this a bit in the last uh, session, and I would invite an invite. Uh, this was Ron. Uh, Ron, Ron May, yeah. Ron May, I'd invite you to go back over the ver relevant portions of the recording. Yes, is the short answer, although typically there's no real reason to use a strobe as opposed to continuous lighting to do backfill lighting on some of the flowers because, uh, you, you know, your camera's on a tripod, it doesn't matter how long the exposures are, nothing's really moving. So you could use a flashlight, you could use sunlight, you could use uh, an LED uh, studio light, all kinds of ways to light it, sometimes I do. And Ron Bernstein asks, do you always use all shot images in the HDR or would you be able to use maybe three or five images to get the effect also which would cut down on the processing time? You know, great question. Um, the processing time isn't really so much the image. First of all, I, I should point out that I'm doing this processing on a somewhat underpowered laptop, which is what I use for webinars. And on my production machine, an image like this wouldn't be so bad. Um, but you know what? I'm willing to spend the processing time. It's still a great question because the fact is that you get different results when you feed in three images, when you feed in five images, and when you feed in eight in images to any HDR program. And simply from the point of view of the different re results, it's sometimes really worth playing with that to see what you get. Um, the fact is that the more images you feed in, the better your results are likely to be. Also, and this is an important also, the HDR program is not all that bright, okay? 
it does one thing. It does that one thing pretty well, which is combining pixels for an extended dynamic range. But it really doesn't know that you're only interested in the high key HDR portions of this image. So, you know, you can, you can try and make it do that as much as you want by say only throwing in the three high key stuff that you really want and it isn't gonna get it. So yeah, it usually works better to put in more, to put in the full range of images. Um, on the other hand, as you'll see, this whole HDR part of the process is not the most major part of the process. And uh, one more question from Sabine. If you loaded them into the HDR program from Lightroom, does it apply its default sharpening, et cetera? Sure. Yes, would be yes. the answer. <laughs> all right, I think that's all for now. What I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is why I haven't got anything here. And Ronald says it, he's glad it's not just his computer with the spinning wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't even have the spinning wheel. I have nothing. <laughs> it's like opening up what you think is a beautiful avocado, and you open it up, and it's uh, wait a minute, it doesn't look good inside. <laughs> what happened? Ah, there we go. Here it comes. Here it comes. Well, I'm glad I'm only doing this once on full resolution images is all I can say. Uh, but we'll, we, uh, you know, as I said, I prepared the other examples by going in, taking down the resolution and taking, and taking, taking down the PPI, taking down the size, cutting them into about a tenth of what they were. So none of that is gonna have this kind of time frame. So if you look at one of these programs, one of these defaults, what I typically use here is either structurized like this, which looks awful, god awful without other settings, or just the normal default HDR. If I pick the normal default HDR here, what I'm gonna to have to do to make this something that anybody is gonna to wanna to use for anything is bump the exposure way up, okay? Um, so I've done white, I've increased the structure in it because that's really what one wants for structure. And I'm going to reduce my shadows, up my highlights, and this is not using an HDR program the way you're supposed to use an HDR program, but it is what it is. And then, so let me just reemphasize that point. I came, I, I came into this HDR program, I opened it up, it looked ugly. So let me just show you how ugly it looks again, okay? Well, that's minus 100%, but at its default exposure, this thing looks like, why would I want this thing? Does everyone see that, please? If there's anyone who doesn't see that it looks ugly, please uh, let Phyllis know. Uh, now I'm going to boost the exposure 100%. This is not something one is really supposed to do with this software, okay? Your, your mileage may vary in that you, uh, you will find that different HDR software does this differently. As I said uh, uh, in answer to a question a little while ago, this is not the most brainiac of software in terms of being able to read your mind in terms of what you want. I mean, I'd want the software to say, hey, this is a light box image. He isn't going to want the dark stuff, but that's not what HDR software does. It does one thing. So I'm now clicking OK. And once this image is processed, I'm going to save it in a work in progress file, okay? I call my work in progress files uh, WIP, and that I keep every step that I do because that means I can get back to them if I've made a mistake, and I can also look them up if someone says, Harold, how did you do that image? I actually always have the digital evidence of how I process that image. The convention is to call these uh, work in progress files in a folder called uh, WIP. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, a workflow idea that I learned from the rather elegant Photoshop practitioner, Katrin Eisman. 
Nancy Scott says the images are social distancing, which is why they're slow today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Nancy. You know, they're not any slower than normal. I, I spend my life this way. I mean, what what do they say? If you uh, if you don't want if you uh, d if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. This stuff this is time consuming. Uh, okay, so first of all, it's important to look at images all the time, anytime, at various magnification levels. I mean, at this level, you say, why might I use it? But if you go in here, you can see that, for example. I uh, particularly the areas of the tulip petal here as some really cool details that one might want to use. Okay, so I'm going to uh, reduce the size of this thing back to something manageable on my screen. And as I said, I'm going to save it off. I go save as. And I'm going to, um, let's see, where are we here? We are on the mini rocket in photos, in class demos, and then I create a new folder called WIP. And normally I also create under here a separate folder for this project. I'm not going to do that this time, but, and I label it with what it is. It's the default HDR processed version and I'm gonna save it. Okay, that wasn't so terrible now, was it? So let's minimize this for a minute. We're gonna go back to bridge. If we can find it in here, wherever it is, there it is. And what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna process the lightest version of the image. And here's where the rubber starts to beat the road. Okay, so I'm double clicking the image in bridge. Uh, to open it in Adobe Camera Raw. And here you see the image in Adobe Camera Raw. You know, for the most part, I'm not gonna change anything here. I'd uh, prefer to have it at uh, uh, daylight values, more like 5,500 Kelvin than what the auto white balance thought it should be. So I change it to 5,500 Kelvin. Otherwise, I haven't changed anything else about these settings to, there, there's a further discussion we can have at some point about white balance and how to handle it. But for now, as I said the last time, you can just use auto white balance and change what you need by changing it to, uh, to daylight to 5,500K roughly. I've made it a little warmer than it would otherwise be. I hold down the alt key and I open a copy of the image. So now we get to the question of why not crop? The, the answer to why not crop is because if you do crop, you won't necessarily be able to align images as, as you want later on. But I really don't wanna see our uh, rug attractive or otherwise in this image. So what I do now is I sample the background color, which may look white, but it's not entirely white. I take my brush tool in Photoshop, I put my opacity to 100%, my flow to 100%, kind of medium, now well, it's too small, uh, maybe 1400 pixel brush size, and I paint out the rug. And Barbara has a question, why open a copy? Um, actually, you can't open anything but a copy. You, you cannot overwrite a raw file. The, what, opening, what opening a copy does is it ensures that your original settings are not, uh, are not integrated in the, uh, in the XML as part of the image itself. But I would always want even, so Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw won't, and Lightroom and Bridge and so on, won't let you open the original because they want to protect you from your own worst destructive instincts. But even if you could, I wouldn't want to because I want to archive my original raw files. But thanks for the great question. So 
Now I go to the next one up my layer stack, all right? And I'm just gonna make the same change I made before, uh, changing the white balance to daylight, and I'm going to open a copy of it. So one thing I forgot to do while I had the first image open was to start it as a saved file. So we'll do that before we do anything with the next image. Okay, so here was the first copy of the image that I started with. And I'm in it, this is 8196 is my, uh, is the number of the file per my camera. And note that I have my camera set, by the way, to include my initials as part of the file name. Um, you can see HLD8196 here. That's something you can set in your own cameras and it's probably worth doing. Otherwise, it will come back with the default that your camera manufacturer has. For Nikons, that would be DSC is what all files are done. In any case, I'm going to save this. I'm going to save it in the same WIP folder and I'm going to call it pass. Okay. And I label my passes the number of times through it alphabetically pass.a, pass.b, pass.c. This again is a convention I picked up from uh, Katrin. Uh, the important point here would be to label the layer so that you know what it is. This was 8196, and this is the bottom layer of my layer stack. You can see that in the layers panel right here. And there are various reasons that you wanna be careful about labeling your layers. Uh, the most important for me is that I work with my beautiful wife Phyllis on books sometimes, and she says to me, where did that come from? And if I, if I didn't label my layers so that I can tell her where it came from, I'm in trouble. So what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to copy 8197 over into the layer stack, and I'm going to do this so that it is in alignment, okay? The the emails that Phyllis and I get for the uh, Photoshop darkroom books that we wrote, the single biggest question is how do you copy a layer over in complete alignment? So I'll, I'm gonna be doing this again in the presentation, but there really are two easy ways to do this. There's always more than one way to do everything in Photoshop. What I just did was I selected the move tool in, on my on my tools panel, I'm pointing my mouse cursor at the move tool. That's where it is. Uh, on the source image, I clicked on the source image. I held down the shift key. Somewhere within the source image, I dragged it over to the target image. I let go of the shift key and then I let go of the mouse. That will do it and that I sometimes call the cowboy or cow person method of doing it. The other thing you can do is with the source selected, you go select all, you move over and then you go edit, copy, then you move over to the target and you go edit, paste. I'll do that method next time. And note that when I show it on my computer, I use the menu items because those show and keyboard shortcuts don't, but there are easy keyboard shortcuts for these things as well. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna shut 8197, I don't have to save it. And we have a two image layer stack here with 8197 on top. So I'm gonna go layer, layer mask, hide all, and that hides to a nine seven, and I'm going to paint it in. So generally speaking, you wanna paint at a flow of about 50%. This is how fast the ink or the, comes off the uh, 
brush and you want an opacity at this point in your layer stack of something like 68, 69, 70%, and you want a brush size that depends on your subject. I'm gonna put my brush like this. So here's where the magic sort of starts. You start painting in what's under there and you don't wanna to get too close to the rug down here or the rug will show. To me, this part of the process reminds me of the dark room where, the chemical dark room where you used to be in the developer, you would see what you got because here, what we see is the developer and showing what we got. I'm, okay, I'm gonna go back down to bridge and pull up the next layer. So the next one, is 8198, which is one second. I'm gonna to remember to put the um, white balance to daylight so they're all consistent. Gonna open up a copy. Oh, and Michael has the question, if you're doing raw conversion in Lightroom, can you just open as layers in Photoshop? Yes, absolutely. Um, there, there are there are two ways to to do this. This is on the photo menu in Lightroom. I will show this later on in the presentation. The, the, this is the edit in, and if you multi-select and use the edit in menu in Lightroom, you can open as a layer stack, or you can just single uh, select and go edit in Photoshop and open it more or less like this. When I'm working from Lightroom, I prefer not to open it as a layer stack because you really don't necessarily know what order it's gonna open it in and whether it's the order you want and you wanna be able to, to control that. So my recommendation is to open them singly from Lightroom, but yes, you can open them as a layer stack with the idea that you may have to move them around in the layer stack once you've done that. I will, sh I will show that though later. So, Instead of using the move tool this time, I have uh, 8198, the one second version, going over the four second and two second versions here. And so what I do is I go select all, otherwise known as command A. I go edit, copy, otherwise known as command C. And then I go to the target and I go edit, paste, otherwise known as command V. And that gets it in alignment, and this is 8198. Please feel free to use whichever version of copying over you feel most comfortable with. Some people really prefer to do it using, using the menus and keyboard shortcuts rather than the uh, mouse. So again, I'm gonna put a layer, layer mask, hide all, and you can see how that takes off the uh, darkening from the darker layer and I'm going to specifically start painting it a little more selectively. So I have the tulips here, again at 68%. Now I don't want my leaves to get too dark here. So um, I'm gonna take down the opacity to maybe 40, oh, 40, 42, 41, 42 is a good percentage. Uh, so that just is a little bit darker. That's probably about as dark as I want the leaves, but I need a little more uh, darkness in the, in, in the next uh, version. So, it, so particularly if you, look, if you look at it up close, and I do recommend always looking at it up close, there's not enough uh, detail in this part yet. So we need to, we're gonna need to add some stuff there. So we go to the next version. I don't care whether you can export the clipboard or not. Sometimes Photoshop is so irritating. Um, okay, the next one's at a half a second. I tell you what, for the sake of this demo, I'm gonna skip to, right to a quarter of a second, which is really quite dark. And you can do that, you know, you don't have to use every layer that you have. Um, this one, 
One thing you'll find that auto uh, white balance when you get uh, darker in your exposures tends to raise the Kelvin temperature of what it's reading. Shows how actually approximate all auto white balance settings really are. And, you know, this is not exactly a scientific process either. Okay. Uh, yes. Danielle has a question. What is smoothing at 10% doing and how do you pick the percentages? Well, trial and error. Smoothing at 10% is the Photoshop default. You'll find that w when you open up the brush tool, that's what it's always set to. And that just is, is Photoshop's idea about how to create boundary areas and what to do with it. Picking the percentages for how much you paste in is pretty subjective. Um, but as I said in the previous presentation, this is a bit like a wedding cake. The further toward the bottom of the layer stack you are, the higher the percentages are. Now, now we, looking at the brush tool for just a second here, opacity is a different issue than flow. Flow is how comfortable you are with using the tool, basically. It's, it's like, how fast is it coming out of it? So that's going to be different whether you're using a stylus or a mouse or, or how well you handle it or how comfortable you are with the thing. Also, um, I think when you're setting up the brush tool, you need to make sure the hardness is not set to zero because you'll have a very hard edge on the tool. Um, or the okay. hardness should be set to, or I can't remember yeah. it. Okay. So, yeah. so I, I have right now the, uh, the, the settings for my brush tool up and I have almost no hardness on it. Okay. But what I want for hardness, Phyllis brings up a very good point and one that we're going to go into a little more next time with more advanced processing. But yes, the, this hardness slider, which you see right down here, is a very important tool. If you have it at 100%, it's got a hugely sharp defined edge. Um, if you don't want the edge to be too visible, you, you have it at 10% or less. The problem with that, though, can be that you'll get dispersion over the area you want. And in this case, that leads to the deadly gray blur issue, which is something that we'll be talking about a bit more because it's one of the biggest problems with this process. And uh, James has the question, is the layer blending mode set at normal at 100% for all the layers? At this point, all the, le all the blending mode is set to normal. Correct. And Nancy wants to know if you're using a Wacom tablet. Not to do this in this demo. I have one attached to my production computer, uh, and I will use it sometimes for real detail areas, but I'm actually pretty happy with using a mouse, too. There are people who will not use anything other than a, than a tablet and stylus, however, for this kind of work. Matter of taste. So we're again, we're copying an alignment. And actually that worked for me. And remember, we skipped one here, so we got a lot darker fast. And in real life, I probably wouldn't do that or not very often. I'm not allowed to get impatient in real life. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And what I'm going to do here is just paint in the tulip. Okay, that's all I care about here. Okay. Everybody see that? <laughs> in a class, when I say everybody see that, I can see people's reaction. Here, I'm talking to my own computer. I don't know. Okay, so, so let's have a look at that for a second. And there you see, isn't that delicate? This nice soft petal here. You see the translucency of the purple coming through the white tulip. That's really the point of this whole thing is that kind of little passage. I think of the individual parts of these images as like passages and, and notes. So, okay. So I'd say this is done uh, from the white layers. What I would like to do is go back to the HDR image that um, I processed. And I'm going to put it on top, showing I can't really spell, but okay. And so up here, we have HDR at the top of my layer stack. And 
I put a mask on it, layer, layer mask, hide all. And then let's go into the detail part here and paint just a wee, wee little bit. So I have my brush. I'm not going to want 42%. I'm going to want, say, 20%, enough so one can see what it is, but not enough that it really overwhelms things. Okay. So we're just painting a little HDR detail into these petals at this point. That's all we're doing. It's nothing, it's not a big deal. It's a small percentage of the entire image. Okay, just like that. Maybe a little bit into the green too. Just like that. Okay, so this is approximately the first part of the processing of this image. The, from here, the next steps, and I think I'm going to uh, spare people um, waiting through saving this image. No, maybe not. I'll make, I'll make your way through it because it's important. So what you do next is you save the image in its current state, you archive the saved layered image, you merge it down, and you crop it to where you want it if there's cropping involved, and then you uh, move on from there. And the moving on from there falls outside of the scope of today's presentation. It falls into the scope of next week's presentation. But essentially, you have the image at this point. Uh, Shelley has a question. Uh, I see that you add one file to the stack and process it before adding another. Can you add all the files to the stack all together instead of one by one? Well, that's a, thank you, Shelley. That's a little bit like the question of, can you add a whole layer stack in Lightroom? Yeah, you can add the stack all together, but the masks are all different each time. And, the, and I find that when I add them one by one, I see what I'm doing better than if I try to add them all in a group. But there's nothing to stop you if you prefer from adding them all in a group and then creating individual layer masks. That, that can work that can work as an alternative workflow along with the idea that photoshop has more more ways to do things than any one person can ever know it also has multiple ways to do things my recommendation here is to add layers one by one because that this is really a, essentially a manual process and I, I, I assure you, I'm not a Luddite at heart. I love computers and I love my machines and I love my cameras, which are ultimately computers, but I'm a believer in humanity and in art that feeling and watching images and craftspersonship beats anything that the machine can do. So I would say that you are better off not doing it all at once, even if you can. Okay. Uh -huh. So oh, can I ask a couple more questions? Go right ahead, my dear. Okay. For you, anything, Phyllis. Thank you. Joe says, is there some sort of general rule for what details get HDR layer painted on? Yeah, I mean, good question, Joe. This is a uh, judgment call. Generally, I want to paint on details where there are details. I mean, that sounds silly, but it's true. And here's a general, um, a general principle with flowers. Generally, the center of the flowers, the stamen, the pistils, the, for a black, lack of better word, the flowers' sex organs, they, are, they have lots of details. You want the centers of flowers to be, have high resolution. Petals, not so much. Petals should be airy and fluffy and uh, lacy and romantical. The uh, thing is that a tulip petal itself has this ridge going up the center of the tulip like, uh, like this. So that's a detail I would want to emphasize. So, okay. And also when it's like white like that, you have to be careful because of the white background so that there's a distinction between the edge of the petal and the white background too. 
that's very correct. And that leads to the uh, dread gray blurring problem, which comes up a lot. So as I said, the next step here is to archive this image, uh, go layer, flatten image to merge it down. And you can crop it. And generally, I would take off where the rug is. You would crop it here like this. Maybe it's generally a good idea to have about the same white margin on the right, left, and top, and top. You perhaps a little more on the bottom. Crop it like that, and then you can save this version as as a dot a. And ultimately, in your workflow, you move on from here. Uh, Shelley has a question about cropping. When you consider cropping, do you have a preference on ratio? Or does the image contact dictate the crop? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and, a, and another very subjective one. There is something to be said for sort of standard crops, namely the original image format in, uh, you know, a full, a full frame being uh, 1.5 to 1. Um, square has its uses. And also, if you're going to actually be using it in a video format, the 16 to 9 ratio is helpful somewhat if it's a horizontal image. However, um, if you're going, what you're going to do with it is make a print, which is often where my flower images end up. Then, really, it's what works for a particular flower image. Uh, I don't have anything magical here, except that part of the craft is to develop an eye for this and to use your own good judgment in it. And trust yourself. And trust yourself. Uh, you know, I tend to be a little bit more, I do work with Phyllis on printmaking. I, I tend to be a little bit more like, let's use one of the standard formats. And of course, in the, in the Photoshop crop dialogue up here, you can tell it you want a square, you can tell it you want the original ratio. I tend to be a bit of a, okay, let's try to use the original ratio if it works. Phyllis is more like Harold. Well, if it looks good that way, just go with the way it looks good and don't worry about it. I mean, who came up with these original ratios anyhow? Was no, was no genius. Phyllis, I, if there are any outstanding questions, that would be great. Otherwise, I, I want to move on because there's a fair amount of ground to cover still. Okay, there's just one more from James. Can we have a quick hint as to how to handle the gray problem? <laughs> well, uh, you, can, you can have several hints. Uh, actually, it was promised on the agenda for today. Number one, the best way to handle the gray problem is not let it happen. So. In this image, I'm going to go back to before I flattened it, okay? And let, let's move in here. There's a slight gray blurring problem here, okay? So um, okay. So where did that gray come from, all right? I ask, I ask you that as a philosophic question. What, what, what layer put it in? Well, maybe it's more than one. If you keep an eye on this and you say it came from, well, it came from the darkest too, what you can do is you can make sure that it isn't painted in. So the way you do that is you put black on your brush, you make sure you are painting on the layer mask. Photoshop will fool you every time about that one. You take a small brush tool, you, that's a little too big. You make sure it has some hardness in it because you want an edge here so that you're not painting over your, um, your, your actual line, and you make sure you don't get gray in the first place. Now, this takes some delicacy of touch. Oh, yeah, you have to also have your opacity and flow set to the max for that to actually work. So this actually takes care of the gray problem before you even get there. I don't have any gray in this area now. Okay, I would have to go round all my petals carefully, though, to fully do this. Okay, so that's hint one for the gray. Okay, hint two for the gray is let's let's go open up the. Um, now, like, actually, what I'm going to do if I get my mouse back, where's my mouse? Okay, I'm going to close this without saving. I'm going to reopen the A version of this. 
and here it is. Okay, so in this case, we were careless, and we didn't, and we, and we let gray come into the background here. Okay, so you can see a bit of the dread gray blur there. Now, honestly speaking, as dread gray blur goes, I have seen worse. I've seen dread gray blur so bad that it gives me nightmares and shivers. Somewhat actually depends on what you're gonna do with the image. If this image is gonna go on a background, you probably wouldn't even see this in the end anyhow, but okay. So is the background of this image where it was on the light box really pure white? No. So what you want to do is you want to use the eyedropper tool to sample what it is well away from the dread, dread blur and put it in the uh, foreground color palette. Then take your brush, take it at 100% flow, make sure it has a bit of sharpness in the 20 to 30% range, and paint out the blur with the background color. It was uh, James, I think, who asked about the dread gray blur. Correct, Phyllis? Correct, it's James. Well, James, there, there are two, uh, two very highly effective techniques for ridding ourselves of the dread gray blur. They both take a bit of attention and time. I recommend both. You know, spend some effort as you build up the layer stack and not having gray in the first place. But if you, in the end, you see you do have some, paint it out using white, please. There is yet a third technique, which is to use a L-channel curve adjustment in LAB color to handle it. And I'll be showing that either in the creative LAB, well, probably both in the creative LAB color webinars, also in the uh, one next week for advanced processing techniques. When I when I put up the the sam the, this set of sample images and when I figure out where I'm going to do that, um, I'll also put up the part I processed so far so that you can play with it and take it apart to see what we did. Okay. Well, I'll I'll probably create a uh, web page on our site with a link to downloading it or something like that. Uh, yeah, it may, that that's probably the best way to do it. Well, but uh, will give us a little time to figure that out. Okay, so I want to show a problem. <laughs> a problem and a solution. So let me just find the file that I'm looking for here. So Okay, so not that one. So just to give you an idea of what we're, look, what we're looking at here, here's, here's an image. This is actually a nice poppy from our yard a couple of weeks ago. And um, what um, I did was I processed it and um, we're gonna open this up and I'll show you the problem, and then I'll show you the solution. So, let's see, by the way, while, while this is loading, um, it's a Popover Hybridium Lawrence grape. I don't quite know who Lawrence was, or Lawrence was, but, uh, she sure has a beautiful poppy. I'm assuming it, the horticulturist was a she. It's a hybrid of some kind. It came from a local horticultural uh, nursery here called Annie's Annuals and Perennials in um, Richmond, California. And they do a nice mail order of poppies. I had one student of mine, a gentleman who lives in, in one of the barrier islands in Florida who was dying to photograph poppies. And he tells me that he told me I can't grow them there. So he ordered some from Annie's and he said they're flourishing. So you might want to consider it as a supplier. Okay, so from a distance, this kind of looks pretty good, right? And you'll notice we've got the layer stack created the way I suggested over here, uh, starting with the brightest image, paint it in a bit. 
paint it in a bit, paint it in, in a bit, paint it in a bit more. I looked at this, I looked at it on my big monitor and I said, something is not quite right here. What is not quite right? Well, to really find out what's not right, you have to go in real close. I'm gonna even go closer. And you can see that alignment screwed up. That's a technical term, term screwed up. So what, what I did was I, um, I obviously moved my tripod just a little bit between exposures, right? So moral of the story, don't move your tripod uh, between exposures. I was a little bit like, oh my God, I've put almost this, so much effort into this. And by the way, if you look back in Bridge, just combining these layers wasn't the only effort I put into it. Uh, I've been to, through F version of this by the time, you know, by the time I noticed that it was no good. Um, so I said, well, you know, do I put more effort? Do I put it up? You don't really see it at Instagram levels. Anyhow, it will look fine on Instagram. Do I just keep going? What do I do? Here's, here's, here's the version that I noticed it. I can't, you know, and it's got these echoes here that are just not pretty. So I said, well, you know, I, I, as an artist, I have to be my own toughest critic. I cannot post this. What can I do? So what I did was I went back to the original files and I picked one. Now here's where, and what the, num the one I picked was 8181. And you can see that I, I said, well, let me pick the one that's basically closest to what we where we want to end up. And here, here it is. Now, the only thing that is really not really sort of uh, perfect about 8181 is the center of the flower is too dark. Uh, I, I've said that one reason for shooting a bracketed sequence, two weeks ago I said one reason for shooting a bracketed sequence is that you have all the different exposures to contend with. So the answer here for me was to go back to this single version and then fix the center with multiple raw processing, which is another way to go besides HDR. So if you open the image here and and you take a look at it, and a reason for not cropping at this point is you wanna keep the alignment in place. You know, eventually for me, I shot this with the idea of doing a square image and the square proportions look almost perfect here, but you know, the center, the center is not really where I want it. So what I do is I go back to my single exposure and I make sure that I still have the same uh, settings for conversion. I can choose previous conversion. And what I do then is I boost the exposure for just for the center. I'm not worrying about the rest of it. That's probably too far, but this is two EVs, or okay, 1.8 EVs brighter than it was before. And I'm opening a second raw exposure of the image. And then what I'm going to do once the second raw, the second version of the exposure is up, is I'm going to copy it over the image and paste it in the center. So there you have this nice bright version. I copy it over in alignment, I put a layer mask on it, layer, layer mask, hide all. And then with my brush on white, I wanna make sure my brush is fairly soft, about 8%. And I'm going to put my flow down to 50%. That's normally when I want control, that's where I put my, my uh, 
And the, the, the trick with brushes is to right size them. You don't want a brush that's too small and you don't want a brush that's too big. You want a brush that's just right, the Goldilocks brush. If you, if you have it too small, it's gonna look pokey. If you have it too big, it's gonna overwhelm the image. So you want a just right sized brush. So just to uh, recap here, we, we have two raw versions of this image, one file. I paint in the second, raw, the second version to get the center of the flower to the way, to way I want it. And I'll go on from here to do a little refinements. But the truth of the matter is that just there, with that very, very, very simple move, I'm 90% of the way uh, to, to the final of the image. Okay. Uh -huh. Harold Inger has a question. He is wondering if you're using focus stacking in combination with bracketing. I am not using focus stacking in combination. Thank you, Inger. I'm not in these examples using focus stacking in combination with bracketing. I'm not, what's the word? I wouldn't put it past me, but keep in mind that you are multiplying the number of images that you have to deal with. It's a little bit like, uh, do you use a panorama in addition to HDR? Well, yeah, but that if you have five panels in a panorama and each one has seven exposures, that's 35 images. Now, what would you do if you had a focus stack panorama and you had 10 points on your focus stack of five images, each at seven exposures? Well, it's multiplicative. You pretty soon uh, need a machine to deal with all of that. The, uh, there, there is some software that will do some of it automatically. We'll do different exposure and focal blends. I think I said either uh, last time or the time before that focus stacking doesn't come into play that much with light box photography because really it's pretty flat on the light box. In situations where it's not, uh, focus stacking can be a huge help. Okay, I'm going to just shut these down. Are there any specific questions about this example of using a single image with multi-raw processing to, uh, to create your final? I don't have anything yet, but I'll okay. wait a minute and see if anybody pops up. All right, so let me move to a couple of the prepared examples that I have that are reduced. So, um, first of all, Mm, that doesn't look so good, does it? I wonder why. Oh, and Joe wants to know if it's possible to include all the links in a follow-up email that have been running through the chat. And yes, I will um, send the uh, all the links in an email to everyone. And Angelina wants to know, does Harold merge multiple images first, then move it to a layer? Generally, the other way around, Angelina. Generally, every separate image is a layer. If I understood that question correctly. Okay, so here's some here here are reduced. I showed the final that I made of this image, but here are uh, some reduced size. They've already been converted through Adobe Camera Raw, so we're not going to see that step here. Um, I can move this through uh, through Nick perfectly well if I want, and it shouldn't take so long as before because it's a small file, small file size. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. And the much, much less patience trying. Okay, move it a little lighter here. Create HDR. And okay, um, this balance one looks pretty nice here. I could just take that as it more or less as it stands, add a little bit more structure to it. Okay. So we have an HDR image here. And Well, we're 
going to just uh, call it something, call it reduce. Well, we don't really need to save it in point of fact. Um, so I'm going back to my reduce files here. I'm going to start with the lightest one. I'm going to move to my next one and I'll copy it over. Just like that, close down this one. Layer, layer mask, hide all. So what I'm really doing an overview here is showing a very quick process. Paint in the areas that I wanna paint in here. You'll see the finished version of the thing in real high res up on my Instagram feed and uh, my Flickr feeds. I'm perhaps, yeah, perhaps Phyllis, you could include uh, my Instagram, I guess, handle in, in the email that goes out. I guess it will because that's part of how we want you to tag photos you want me to take a look at. And so I'm going to go up to the next one. This is six seconds. The last one was 13. The first one was 25. And here I have to start getting a little careful. The, I, the idea here would be that I'm pretty happy with the red and darker poppies here, but the white could use a little more work. So one of the points of this whole process is that you can individually paint in whatever areas you want. It doesn't all have to be uniform. So I would go for the next one here and make it a little darker. like this. And put a layer mask on, layer, layer mask hide all. I'm going to move my brush a little smaller here and just paint in the white like that. You don't want to get your nice white stuff lost in the melee. And this is a nice columbine from our garden. Everything in here is straight from our garden. So our garden's doing okay right now. Okay, and contrast, you should look at contrast. Remember the chiaroscuro uh, slide in my original presentation three weeks ago the sense of the illusion of depth in these images is partly made by the contrast between lights and darks, which was the original meaning of chiaroscuro. So we started at 25 seconds, mostly white, added in this, 15, 10, so on, like that. Okay, let's go to another example. And uh, this will be the uh, last example for the session. I think we're, we're running a little over in time, aren't we, Phyllis? Oh, just a little bit, but um, you know, if anyone needs to leave early, I've had a few uh, chats on that one. Um, we're uh, we are recording the session, and when we get the chance, we take a breath of air. We will be uh, putting it up on YouTube. So if there's anything you miss, you can watch it, or you can watch the whole thing again. Whatever you'd like to do. So um, here's Harold's YouTube channel. The link for it, I'm going to put it into the chat, but I'll also be sending it in the email I'm going to send out. And we'll have, we have a slide at the end also, I think, with that. Correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to go over this fairly quickly because I don't want to keep people beyond the time we originally said. Uh, not surprised to find the session run over, though, when I do this in a part of it in a, in a in-person class, usually me demonstrating it takes maybe an hour and a half, and then people spend three or four hours doing it on their own where I can give some feedback. So if you look at this image, here's, um, here's an eighth of a second, here's a quarter of a second, here's a half a second, one second, two second, four second, eight second. So the idea here would be you open it up at eight second, you sample the um, background to get, a, to get the right white, you put the brush at 100% opacity, 100% flow, 
and you paint out the light box at the edges. Remember that's part of the secret magic technique for getting rid of uh, tripod legs, light box edges, rugs, kid stuffies, anything you don't want to see in the final image. It already looks so much better once when you just when you just do a little bit of that. Even if you're going to crop it out later, it means you can actually see what you're doing when you uh, when you when you. So here's the next one. This would, the first one was at eight seconds. This is at four seconds. Painted over. Blunk, like that. Okay. Layer. Layer mask, hide all. And I'm just going to very quickly paint a lot of this in. Just like that, okay. Then I'm gonna move on to the next one. And what I'm gonna do this time, a shortcut, because I figured that down at this, down this far at the bottom of the layer stack, I can just use the same layer mask. So if I hold down the Alt key and raise it up, it just copies it like that. Turn it off. Turn it on. Okay. Incidentally, one thing I'm seeing on the right of my image over here is I'm seeing that I let a bit of the edge of the light box come through. Well, you know, that's that's not a terrible, terrible sin, but um, we really don't want it. So I put my brush to 100%. I put it a little smaller than it was and I'm gonna paint it out on that layer and I'm gonna paint it out here and we don't see it anymore. So I'm gonna do one more layer here. This one is at a second and it's actually beginning to, to be the way we really want the, the thing to look. You know, it's not that far off the, uh, I, off the uh, final. I have the move tool, I move it in, I go like that. Shut it down. I put a layer, layer mask, hide all, and I paint this wonderful melange of flowers. Again, everything here is from our garden or from the sort of traffic circle that's right outside our house, which there's a long story there, but it's got beautiful flowers in it right now. These are Nemesias, these things that look like sort of insects in the center there. And of course, foxgloves, digitalis, 4th of July roses from our garden, poppies, a couple of uh, Gilardias blanket flowers, which actually are, are natives. And there you have it. Are there any questions about this particular example? Um, I don't see anything at the moment. Uh, Carrie is wondering if we will see this process from Lightroom. Same thing. You just bring in the um, Oh, oh, images. so I should show that. I promised to show it. Hold on. Let me do so. Excuse me. I had forgotten about that. Hold on a second. And Danielle says she uh, wants our garden. <laughs> Can't have it. <laughs> but once social distancing is out of place, you're more than welcome to visit. Absolutely. Come to Berkeley. Come to Berkeley. And Shelly has a question. Instagram has restrictions on crops. Sometimes the crop I like doesn't work. Do you encounter this? Uh, I hate Instagram. I love Instagram. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shelly, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it doesn't really have restrictions on crops. You can put up anything you want, but it crops them. Okay, so it, it depends, and, it's, and I mean, this becomes a technical issue pretty quickly. It depends on the viewing device that you use. It's really designed for people looking at it on a, on a phone, of course. And that's, I suppose, why people love it because, but, and that's not how I love to view my own photos best. 
But so, yes, I find this all very frustrating in some ways. It, it actually doesn't really have crops as to what you upload. As I said, it has crops as to how it shows it, which, you know, may be a sort of semantic distinction with a distinction without a distinction. But, but, um, you know, I, uh, that's why I have my own website where I control things. I recommend it. And if you get too upset by what Instagram has done for, it's the easiest for me to view your photos if you will post them on Instagram. And that way I can, I can see them. And on the fifth and last session of this, where we're looking at all the wonderful work everyone has done, it's an easy way for us to collate it and run through it and keep track of it. But if you really can't stand what it's done and you'd prefer to send it to me as a JPEG or send me a link to it on your website, that's fine. I'll look at it any way it comes. I am not so picky. So for all those who want to know Lightroom, you know, do whatever you're going to do in the develop mode. I've got this image here, or I could perfectly well pick, uh, you know, one of the one of the ones we were just looking at. And to open it up in Photoshop, you go photo, edit in, and then Photoshop right here. That just opens it in Photoshop just the same way uh, one has. You've processed it in the develop mode that's analogous to Adobe Camera Raw. As someone else mentioned, if you want to do it multiple images in one fell swoop, you multi-select, you go photo, you go edit in, and then you can open as layers in Photoshop. This will open it eventually as a layered document in Photoshop. Come on, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Uh, open anyway, and, and here you go. Actually, what I should have done was pick one of my reduced ones, but it doesn't matter. Same idea. Okay. Not 100% sure. Oh, it's different size. That's why I did it that way. But the, the idea holds. Yeah, it helps. It helps when you're coming in through Lightroom if all the images you try to open in a layer stack are, are the same size. Let's see the library. All right, any questions about this? Um, let's see. Ronnie wants to know what does pass mean? <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for the for the minute. Um, well, you know, it, it's either pass or fail, right? It means nothing. The for some reason in in Photoshop work, it's become a convention to say that you do 10 passes on an image. I pick the 10 as an arbitrary, arbitrary number. But when I go back, if I want to track what I've done, I need some way to demark what the, what the, how the workflow went. So what I have is I, I have, first of all, I have pass, and that's usually my initial combination up from the light box. And then I have pass.a, pass.b, pass.c. So I do it alphabetically like that. And that's a pretty common workflow among professionals. If you wanted to call it one, two, three, four, five, that would be fine. It would work just as well. You have to call it something, though. I mean, I could call it Fred. <laughs> uh, actually, Barbara has a really good question. Um, how do you get Photoshop to open in Windows instead of tabs? Yeah, um, so that there's a, it's part of, it's part of the preferences in Photoshop. Um, Phyllis, do you happen, you don't happen to have it open. Uh, no, I don't, but it's in uh, preferences, I believe, in the yeah, general preferences. It's in preferences, but the question would be which preferences. Which when, general there, preference, yeah, no, I, I don't have. Box. Yeah, there's a checkbox that you uncheck, and and what it, and by default it comes. It says open open uh, as tabs, and I uncheck that. Correct. And you can, by the way, if you if you if they are on tabs, you can pull them off the tabs, and they become windows. Exactly. You can just drag pull it. them with your mouth. Yeah, drag yeah. it. All right. That's it for questions for right now.
Okay, so why don't uh, you take back over the screen? Well, uh, please do start posting images. Phyllis will show you some tags to put on Instagram. That way I will see them. And um, yes, use, use, use those tags. Um, and I'll also include these tags in the email I send out. But this is how you can submit your work for review so Harold can see it for next time for the next for, for webinar. Part, for part five. For part five, which is over to you. And also the advanced processing is on May 7th. When in the advanced processing, we'll, we'll work on how you paint in uh, translucency under images. We'll go back over the gray blur issue. We'll, we'll look at LAB enhancements. I'll look at some filters and some filter effects and we'll do various things like that. We'll have fun. Thanks everybody. Love you all. Let's see some work. Hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.